Sling TV has something for everyone. It really just depends on what kind of mood you're in. No matter what you're looking for, you can watch it with Sling. Sports, news, and today's hottest shows. Plus, you can explore thousands of movies and shows on demand. And getting Sling is easy. Sign up and start watching in just five minutes. Stream on any device and record up to 50 hours with your included DVR space. Plus, you won't get locked into a long-term contract. Check out Sling.com for special offers. Sling, the TV you love for a price you love. Try it today. Welcome to the Andy Staples Show presented by Sling. Joined by Ari Wasserman and Scott Docterman. Uh, we have a rule for today's show that Ari and I came up with on Saturday night, Scott. Uh, there's a certain school that we will not <laughs> require you to talk about. In fact, we will try our best not to mention that school's name, although that school does figure rather prominently mm. into the topic that we are going to delve into a little bit later in the show. You just and can't that say is, their name. We made a promise that you can't say the name of the school. We won't say it. So if we talk about the school, you have to say that school. They, they, their uniforms look like the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in a state with a lot of corn. Uh, if you listen to their radio broadcast, there are a lot of ads for seed and, and farm supply stores. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we know who we're talking about. So, yeah. But first, before we talk about how you hire a coach in the year of our Lord 2022 without giving away all your leverage, because that is a it was the hot topic coming off the weekend. It continues being a great topic for discussion, debate, whatever you I got some incredible questions on Twitter about it. I had a column about Jimbo Fisher's deal being the first super awkward version of these. And it's going to continue being an issue. For, for years. So we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about if we have a job opening this year, how do we avoid something like that? But, but first, Scott Docterman breaking some news on Monday morning. This isn't even, this isn't a Monday morning news dump. This is a, this is a charge into your week breaking news story. The big 10 will keep divisions for the 2023 season. And then we'll reorganize when you USC and UCLA show up in 2024 Scott, how, how how much discussion was there of maybe going divisionless after this year? Pac-12 has already done that, mm. even though they still have a division-created schedule. Uh, ACC is going divisionless next year. What what discussion was that? Yeah, there was it was significant, and it ha started as early as when uh, USC and UCLA uh, voted to, or were voted into joining the Big Ten, and even before that, there was a lot of discussion about going divisionless once the divisions were cast out by the NCAA as a rule for your, you know, which is what the ACC did and the Pac-12 did. And so that really started back then. But what kind of came to this crux was a couple of things. One, you know, the Big Ten has still got kind of reeling a little bit from legends and leaders, the names, of course. And then also the fact that it only lasted three years. Geography has lasted nine and you're going to add UCLA and USC in two more years. So it's like, do you really want to have another structure for one year as an interim for another one? You know, this is kind of a historic league that doesn't like to change things very often anyway. Uh, so they thought, well, why don't we bring that back? And then, But then there's also a lot of reasons because a lot of people are scoffing going, man, the East is so top heavy. And this year is the, the greatest of that disparity, no question. But then there, you also look at, but if you go with a, a single conference format, you might lose a Michigan-Penn State game. And, and that's the fifth highest rated game right now uh, in college football and second among Big Ten teams and, and in first when it comes to simply league games. You, you're going to also have new media rights agreements coming up next year. So you, you want to make sure that NBC has decent primetime games, and that's probably going to be one of them or close to it or, or to land on Fox. But if nothing else, in the West, you get some good rivalry games. And then to top it off, you're going to get some – at least another divisional race. I mean, we look at this year at like Purdue, Illinois is probably going to be for the championship of the West. And that's November 12th. Right now, if it was a single division format, it would be for fourth place probably in the big 10. Now it, it at least has hey something's at stake and people will watch because of that. Um, so that's really kind of where they're at. One more year of this. Um, probably one last chance for a few teams in the West to actually have a shot at a, at a, at a championship game. And then they'll just wipe it, the slate clean and go into How something different. How many coaches in the Big Ten West popped champagne with their shirts off today? 
<laughs> well, I could think one in champagne that popped his shirt off anyway, but uh, <laughs> we've all seen that picture. Yeah, but uh, he probably had a can of Schlitz, you know, ah, you know, because it's more like Schlitz, Illinois, rather than Champagne. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, really, you know, well, you don't know because I mean, what's going to happen in Wisconsin and in Nebraska, and who knows that it, maybe another school, you know, there might be some changes going on. So, uh, yeah, that it, it does help them because they at least feel like they can win uh, a West Division title. But you know, I, what I want to also do is look back at what was it like when it was eleven teams before divisions happened. And in the Big Ten, it was pretty – I mean, there Wisconsin w- would have been in that championship discussion. Iowa would have been in that championship discussion quite a bit. You Michigan figured State Nebraska – was starting to get good under D'Antonio. Right. You know, so uh, Nebraska, it, once they get the right coach in there, they're going to be part of that discussion. Uh, Michigan is now back, but from the end of the Lloyd Carr era until the last couple of years, Michigan wasn't automatically rubber-stamped them as the number two – Penn State has kind of been in that discussion. So it was really up until the last two years, it's been Ohio State, a group of about five teams, and then everybody else. And now it's more Ohio State, Michigan, kind of the way it was 2006 and before. So let me ask you this, Scott. When is the next year? In the, so when they move to this inevitably, and maybe mm-hmm. USC and UCLA join, you can even add them into the equation. When will be the first year? Gun to your head. Final moments. Uh, you have it's high stakes. Gun to the head. You got to get it. When is the first time a former Big Ten West team will finish in the top two in the conference? Year wise, uh, two thousand twenty six. Oh, that is a lot sooner than I thought you would say. Highly specific. Yeah, it well, was very specific. Jim Leonard's <laughs> Badgers. Yeah, it could be Jim Leonard's Badgers. It could be Lance Leipold's uh, Cornhuskers. I don't know who's ever going to end up there. <laughs> could be uh, Burt Bielema, you know, and maybe uh, at which school? Yeah, in Illinois or Iowa. Um, oh, you said it. You can't uh, say that you word. You can't say the word, yeah. Scott. <laughs> uh, I blew it already. God, I'm only like five minutes in too. Or I so. Know. So anyway, yeah, it, it could be something like that. But yeah, I don't think it's going to be. Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan every single year. If you say you know, the or, word again, you're going to have to eat the death chip. <laughs> what is that like? Cottage cheese on top. Is you that gotta, you gotta, or what? You got to take a. You got to pay twenty eight dollars worth of Taco Bell, uh, but one of the things in that meal is a death chip, and your dessert is cottage cheese instead of donut holes. If you say that word again. All right. Could you I, imagine if we took all of our challenges and put it into one thing? So it would be a death chip covered in cottage cheese and mayonnaise surrounded by $28 worth of Taco Bell. Yeah. And then you've okay. got to chug a, a dark beer afterwards. You got to chug a Guinness to wash it down. The Guinness, it might actually help wash it down. Yeah. So all yeah, right. that, that is a, that is going to be, I guess it'll just all depend on scheduling, right? Like who is able to, you know, yeah. bob and weave and, and get to the end of the place without having to, I mean, like I think that I would go like 2035. With the yeah. way that there's are... anywhere to hide, though, because mm-hmm. you're getting you're getting everybody. To, I would assume they're going to go with with something similar to what the SEC is probably headed toward, which is a nine game conference schedule mm-hmm. with three permanent rivals, and then everybody rotates through twice every four years. It's really hard to hide at that point. Yeah, I mean, again, we we got to look be before 2021. I mean, Michigan wasn't just what it is today. Wisconsin was pretty freaking good uh, earlier. I mean, they were undefeated in 2017. There was another team in 2015 that was undefeated in the regular season. Uh, you know, you, you've got opportunities there that to, to get to that. It's not just going to be this rubber stamp Ohio State, Michigan, you know, situation. So maybe I'm biased, but I want to ask you this, Scott. Of all the teams that made the Big Ten championship game in the East-West era from the West Division. How many of them do you think still would have made the championship game if they started the year off in the East? Four. I think they're very a, specific. Yeah, I've looked at this before because you look at the East-West divide going into this year, it, the East led the West only 77 to 70 in in um in actual games and regular season games ohio state was 18 and 2 and we all remember the two that they got blitzed at you know at west venues purdue and another team so you know <laughs> there it is there you go <laughs> <laughs> so 
you, you remember those, um, but you know, Wisconsin, Penn State, Michigan, and one other team in the West all had real comparable records against one another. Uh, you know, Penn State had, had lost a couple to one team. Michigan had lost significantly to Wisconsin a few times. I mean, blowouts. Um, in 15, um, you know, one, one team didn't have a loss, and that was the only team, in the, and that was a Western team. Same thing in 17. Now they lost to East Division teams, uh, but you know they were pretty competitive, close games. One of which took a twenty-two play drive. So, uh, you know, th I think that we make a big deal of it because of the name recognition, the recruiting rankings, the money. But you know, Penn State, Wisconsin was a very close game in sixteen. Two thousand fifteen, though, if if school that shall not be named had had to play, not a West schedule, but a all the Big Ten, just sort of mm -hmm. you get who you get schedule. There's a better chance it would have gotten Ohio State, which maybe they win that game, maybe, but probably they don't. And you know, but maybe they don't get them. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, it is possible. I, I'm very curious. I, I want to. Well, you're adding in two extra teams now, and I don't know where you put UCLA in the mix here, mm -hmm. but you're adding two extra teams that I think you could maybe say are further right. down the line. Let, let's. So we got a question from Tulane. Which division will will USC and UCLA be in when they go to the Big Ten? I, I'm not sure. Pe everybody understands this. No, there will be no divisions. divisions. It will just it, be you play. Probably you play three yeah. fixed opponents a year, and then everybody else twice every four years. That is the biggest remaining discussion disagreement: is how many protected foes will you get? The SEC is much smarter with this. It's either one eight or one seven or whatever. Oh no no no! One eight yeah. is not smart. Like, I mean, fire everyone involved. No, no if, what, if, I, what I mean is one eight. <laughs> there are two methods that they're arguing. The right. Big Ten, it's three. Is it two? Is it one? Is it zero? Well, I would expect it to be two or three because you know Michigan's not going to go a year and say, yeah, we're not going to play Michigan State this year. I mean, there's. Uh, you know, so they're going to want to have two. They're really about 10 games that should be protected, but three of which belong to one team. You know, uh, they, they face Nebraska, Minnesota, and Wisconsin every year. Uh, but then you have Penn State, which has said, we don't have anybody we want to protect. So there's this, we'd rather cycle through everybody. I, I they don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? well, but the, the math only works with three. Right, because like, otherwise nice you're clean rotation. Otherwise, exactly, and that's what the discussion is. And and what I've I've had discussions with them, and I've written this before. Is well, if you go three six six, and out of that, uh, what would it be? Twenty one games that get protected. I think it is. Uh, four, no, wait a minute. Be uh, twenty four games that will be protected over a four year block. Ten of which you could deem as like in red, permanent. They're not moving. Ohio State, Michigan, Illinois, Northwestern, all those games. Then there are other 14 you could cycle that's through. That's the second one you pick, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, Purdue, Will, Indiana. Well, Scott, you actually yeah. should do a story that ranks the best and most important protected games in order of importance. I certainly could. You know, I, 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 I did, read the hell out of that. I did one uh, a couple weeks ago where I did like a, a here's the three uh, protected rivals for everybody, 10 of which were in red, and then there are 14 – that that could cycle through, you know, like maybe they decide, you know what, let's let's have Ohio State and USC play four straight years, and then after the end of the four year block, they'll say, well, let's make it Penn State USC or something like that. This is, this is very smart. And after hearing the SEC people argue about this for more than a year at this point, like that's how you need to approach it. It's not. It, we keep using the word permanent. Maybe that's our fault. It's not permanent. Yeah. You can you can shuffle it around, like like we said. Michigan, Ohio State, you will always play. Auburn, Alabama will always play. It's like, but yeah, you, you can change up other things and it's okay. There's this weird line between making things fair and equitable, but also not wanting to go years without most important games. And we had a comment in the in the chat here. I'm trying to find it. It's hard to see. Oh no, two two four. It's hard to mm -hmm. see the Big Ten adding USC and not having them play Ohio State every year. It's like it's not fair to Ohio State or USC yeah. if you make that a protected game. But it's also like if they add that when they add that team, if they don't play Ohio State in a year, it's like, what are we doing? It's like you just got done saying that Penn mm -hmm. State doesn't have anybody that they want to protect. Yeah. Like a year in the Big Ten without Penn State playing Michigan and Ohio State is a worse year than what we have right now. And the entire point of expansion, I guess, right, is to chase the television dollars 
and to create the best possible matchups that you possibly can. And I feel like if you were to lose those games and like Purdue plays Penn State when you're instead of Ohio yeah. State playing Penn State, then the product is worse. And I know people will still watch it, but it's just like, we, we there's so much product here. Well, exactly. There's, there has to be a way to parse through it the smartest possible way. And you know what? The Big Ten, as far as I'm concerned, hasn't been concerned about being equitable on the field or fair. Um, and if they were, then the divisions would look well, different. So well, if they you play, the playoff, it's not as bad because yeah. you might be putting Penn State at a competitive disadvantage, forcing them to play Iowa and Michigan. Uh, I, well, I just said the I word. You bastard. <laughs> when I didn't even mean, I meant Ohio State. Yeah. Not the only person forcing them to play Ohio State and Michigan every year is, is definitely not competitively equitable. But you don't have to win the league to get in the playoff. I mean, you really need to be the third or fourth best team to get in the playoff. Which means that the the thing should be schedule the best games. It's like if it were me, I would I would make sure and like I don't know where Michigan State like what mm-hmm. games that they want to protect. They want to protect Michigan, obviously, right? But does Michigan State have an interest in in protecting the Ohio State game? It no. Doesn't seem like they probably not would, the last right? Couple of years. But, so I'm no. saying like. Well. If you have USC joining the conference, I would want to play watch Ohio State play USC every single year. That's well, the and, best possible game you can make with the expansion. Right. And and then there's also, well, USC, do you want to have them play Michigan or Penn State or Wisconsin? You know, there's that, you know, those games that the track, you know, Andy, I think you wrote about it a little over a year ago, those four million dollar or four million viewer games. Oh, yeah. Those are the games that you bring like in all with of the USC. ones you just mentioned. Are over four million viewers, right? And that's and that is the crux of why. And I don't know why people can't get this through their heads. There will not be divisions because they don't want to see USC go to Northwestern and not Ohio State. They want USC to go to if they're going to go to anybody in the West, it'll be USC, Nebraska, another team that has a really good home environment, or go out to Michigan and Penn State. And you know that's the those are the games that matter. Those are the games that. That you're gonna hear da 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 da, you know, or on Fox it or on NBC. I mean, but think about how many great games we've gotten just because of how lopsided the divisions are. Like over the course of the past seven years, how awesome the the Big Ten East games are uh, every single year. When you have the Ohio State Penn State game and the Michigan Penn State and game, still, and but you're still Michigan have State was good, games. and you will, you will. But it's it breaks my heart to hear that those East teams don't want to protect the games that really have been holding up the conference's viewership for the past decade. And I know there's other teams in like well, Wisconsin it, and that whether they the want it or not doesn't mean yeah. anything. <laughs> no, no, I know. I'm saying like in, in general, like if the thought is that they're not protected and we lose even two of those in a given year and replace them with a team that, you know, if you play Northwestern instead of another Big Ten East team, it just kind of sucks. So like as a fan of the sport, I, I want to see as many good games as possible. And I think that they're on the right track by eliminating divisions in order to try to manifest that as best as they can. Well, and, you know, I was going to say just real quick that, that, you know, with, with a a school like Penn state, that they do bring eyeballs, no matter if they're seven and six, even Michigan state does, Wisconsin does, Nebraska even does, has a really good um, viewership and, and one other team in the West does. So, you know, and then of course, Ohio state and Michigan are off the charts. So, those are the like the seven, the core seven that you want to see play or the, the networks want to see on a, on a regular basis. And then you throw USC in there. UCLA, is it like a, a West Coast version of Maryland or is it better than that? I don't know. I think it's I a think better it's helmet. Probably. I don't know that it's, it's necessarily going to. Better helmet, same same result, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think USC will, will make, like when you put USC against those seven you mentioned, mm-hmm. Those are games that the country will want to watch, especially mm-hmm. in the first seven, 10 years when it's still new. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm fascinated to see how it all shakes out. But for 2023, one more year of the Big Ten West. We lose the ACC Coastal this year, but one more year of the Big Ten West. So let's, we'll cherish every moment. I mm-hmm. guarantee you. When we come back, though, we're going to try to figure out how to hire a coach without giving away all your leverage. I think we may have some different strategies, different ways to come at this. I'm, I'm very excited to see, and I hear Ari's got some numbers that are going to be a little staggering and sobering. When we come back from the break, we'll start off with Ari's game show. Love it. Love it. Dun, 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 dun. Sling TV has something for everyone. All your favorite shows on your favorite channels, all right at your fingertips. What you watch is up to you. 
It really just depends on what kind of mood you're in. So if you're looking for sports, Sling's got you covered with pro and college football and basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, golf, racing, and so much more. Sling also has reality TV, so you can keep up with the latest gossip with today's hottest shows on channels like TLC, Bravo, MTV, and more. And don't forget about news. Get up to date with today's most trusted sources like MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News. If you're feeling adventurous, explore thousands of movies and shows on demand. So what kind of mood are you in? No matter your answer, Sling has what you need. Getting Sling is easy. Sign up and start watching in just five minutes. You can stream on any device and you, rec you can record up to 50 hours using your included DVR space. And the best part is you can pause or customize your subscription at any time. Check out Sling.com for special offers. Sling, the TV you love for a price you'll love. Try it today. I have 10,000 pictures of my kids on my phone, but I have no idea how I'm going to compile all of that into an actual story for them. Artifact completely solves this problem. At the end of each year, they create a narrated video yearbook about each of my kids. Artifact sets me up with a professional interviewer to talk about my children throughout the year. I add photos whenever I want, and the whizzes at Artifact edit it all together into a video yearbook. It's easy, fun, and affordable. The grandparents absolutely love it. And you know what? One day, it's going to be an amazing gift for the kids themselves. You might remember that Artifact is a longtime sponsor of this show. They still do life stories of older family members, but now they have a product for parents like me, watching my kids grow up way too fast and wanting to hold on to those memories while they're fresh. You can sign up to try it yourself for less than $9 a month when you use my code STAPLES at checkout. So go to heyartifact.com slash kids and enter the code STAPLES to get started. That's heyartifact.com slash kids and enter the code STAPLES. Welcome back to the game show that's sweeping the nation. It's Ari Wasserman's coaching statistics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now your host, Ari Wasserman. <laughs> okay, I don't want to take credit for this because I didn't like my editor. Mitch, <laughs> my editor Mitch did this for me because I'm. You can working. hear Mitch. We can say his full name. Mitch, Mitch Light, Light, who you my hear on editor, the Star's my Matter podcast with Ari. Yes. Uh, is a whiz with numbers and he did this for me as I'm working on a story for next week after Penn state loses to Ohio state, uh, which is another illustration of this, but okay. Power five coaching tenures, guys, I'm going to ask you for your guesses from the year 2000 to the current. We'll start off in the big 10 since Scott Dockerman is the king of the big 10. There have been 44 coaching hires and separate tenures in the big 10 in totality since 2000. How many tenures during that span have gone more than 10 years or this, 10, 10 this or plus doesn't years? Count the one guy who, who was hired before 2000 in the Big Ten. Only 2000 name. to current. Okay. So, so somebody who was hired in 1999 doesn't quite fit in this. We can't count. name him, but yes, that guy. Yeah, that guy. Um, there would only be uh, two, if I recall. I um, actually think that these numbers, if they were hired before 2000 to current, the people hired before would count. Okay. But they are. Well, they have been coaching in the Big Ten, and their their tenures have lasted longer. Okay, there are three. There's one uh, who lives about ten miles from where I. I he and right his now. kid who will not be named. Yes, uh, Pat Fitzgerald and Mark D'Antonio. Yes, the answer is six, and six? I I don't for, for ten years. Yeah, mm. um, and the average tenure during that span, I think, is the more important is 5.7 years. Okay. L Lloyd Carr, I think, would have been... Oh, yeah, okay. If, if he oh, right. must not be named counts, Lloyd Carr would count. Trestle. Trestle. Trestle, Trestle would was count. one, too. And yeah. I think there's well, one Trestle more. was actually hired... He was hired for in the year 2000. He was hired, you know, in late 1999 for the 2000 season. Um, okay, SEC now, Andy. Okay. 54 coaching tenures since 2000. Um, okay. What is the average years for their tenure and how many ten years have gone plus ten? ten? Okay, so Nick Saban has gone ten years. Uh, Mark Stoops is in his tenth season now. I don't know if that counts. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Does Gary Pinkle get – does Missouri get credit for Gary Pinkle there? They do. Okay, so th that's three. Gus Malzahn did not go ten at Auburn. I think there's got to be one I'm missing. So I'm going to say, oh, Steve Spurrier went 10 mm -hmm. at South Carolina. So I'm going to go with four. The answer is actually six. 
And okay. I'm I'm reaching out right now to get the answers to these because I should have thought about that before we did. This. <laughs> the answer is six. What is the average years for the coaching tenure in SEC since 2000? 4.2. Five. Good guess. Okay. okay. Pac-12, 51 coaching tenures since 2000. How many have gone past 10? Oh, uh, let's see. Chip Kelly did not go 10. If I don't, if did I did Jeff Tedford get over 10 at Cal, I, I believe he, he did. did. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pete Carroll, did he make it through no. 10? Nope. No, 2000 to 2009. Well, I guess he, he made it 10 seasons. Yeah. I think he actually counts because he made it 10 yeah. seasons. He made yeah, it 10 seasons. seasons. Okay. Um, uh, not on Harbaugh, David Shaw. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Those are the three. Okay. Three total in the Pac-12 since 2000. Average coaching tenure during that span? 4.8. 4.7. Good job, Scott. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Big 12. Okay. There have been 34 tenures Mm -hmm. since 2000. And I think these ones will be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, How many have gone 10 years? So Mike Gundy, Bill Snyder. Yep. Stoops. Bill Snyder part two, that is. Yeah, Yeah, Bob Stoops. Who was hired before 2000? Um, yeah. uh, Mac Brown, who was hired before 2000. Yeah. Um, Gary Patterson, who was hired in 2000? Yeah. Before 2000. Gary uh, Pinkle. Gary Pinkle, if he counts twice. Well, uh, no, I think we count. I think he counts for the <laughs> SEC. Okay. Now. Well, that's all of them. Noted SEC okay. coach yeah. Gary Pinkle. That's all uh, of them. Yep. Big 12, 34 hires. Uh, the, uh, those four, and the average tenure is 4.9. So basically what we're talking about is you have about a 10% chance of your coach yeah, lasting. Yeah, in the years. ACC is 48, 5, and 5.3. Yeah. So if you're looking at the all five Power Five conferences during the co- the, the span there, SEC is 5.0, Pac-12 is 4.7, Big 10 is 5.7, Big 12 is 4.9, and ACC is 5.3. So the average tenure in the Power Five in the past 22 years is roughly five years which is half of the total amount of years that you're giving people. Mm -hmm. Um, Here are the answers for the SEC. Saban, Richt, Stoops, Miles, and Pinkle. Oh, Richt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 2001. ACC was uh, Sweeney, Cutcliffe, Paul Johnson, Dave Doran, and Grobe. Mm -hmm. Jim Grobe. And Mm -hmm. uh, the answers are still coming in. But I think you guys nailed all the Big 12 ones. But I think the point of the matter is here that we're not getting even half the way there with what these and this isn't guaranteed stuff these are extensions a lot of these coaches uh are getting extensions based on performance that you know makes you want to keep them around so and and what's what's wild is the the ones that are going five years have gotten one extension because you don't you don't get to the five-year mark without getting extended right Mm -hmm. so uh it's a it's a pretty interesting situation when you actually look at the data and i think i'm gonna i don't know how i'm gonna write the column that i'm writing next week but let me start this off and i think i said this earlier on the show andy but is there a case to be made that this actually could if we're not prisoners in the moment work out well for the teams that handcuff themselves by forcing themselves to stay with one person through the turmoil and through the Mm -hmm. the um the temptation to fire them when things aren't going well in year five um, and to get to the Dabo Sweeney Sweeney years where mm-hmm. he might've, you know, been on the hot seat a few years at Clemson before he finally broke through to promised land. Could teams that strap themselves in and have no choice, but to stick with the same person, even through the bad years actually come out on top and get the last laugh after 10 years go by. Yeah. Um, you know, the school that shall not be named has, Every re- everything you've talked about there, um, from 2002 to 2009, they won 71 games and were in the top eight four different times. Then there was a 10 year extension. Uh, then for five years, they were 34 and 30 and 19 and, and 21 in the Big Ten, and that did not go over very well. And there was a 17 percent drop in season tickets. The very next year, the that team won 12 games. And since, and over the last five years going into this season, they are seventh among Power Five programs in winning percentage. So, for a team that's never going to win the national title, but be very competitive and oftentimes close to competing for a conference championship, 
I would say that even though that caused a lot of consternation over a lot of years, including this one, that that school has ended up with a, a really smart way of doing it because it could weather the storm rather than having a knee jerk reaction, get them out of there and then be less than Illinois has been for the last 30, 40 years. Well, so I think it just depends on the, on the coach and how willing they are to change I, You know, Brian Kelly's a really good example of this because after 2016, he changed probably more than any other coach has changed or, you know, that program changed more than a program has changed without actually firing the head coach. And some of his best Notre Dame seasons came after that. So I think that that is the key here. And that's like the key with Jimbo Fisher. I have a guy named Greg, a Texas A&M fan, yelling at me on Twitter right now saying, you, you act like Jimbo Fisher is just taking a check and then he's not trying to make it better. I, I'm not saying that at all. I fully, int- I fully believe, and I wrote this in the column, that Jimbo Fisher is going to try to make Texas A&M better in the offseason, and he'll try to make changes that will make Texas A&M better. It's just that if you've ever met Jimbo Fisher, he, he's a pretty headstrong guy. Like His idea of what's going to make things better might differ from his bosses or the fans, and there's no leverage that any of those groups have to change anything. And I also think this is where the leverage is interesting. You know, for Jimbo Fisher – There was leverage, what, this year with uh, LSU. Um, You know, you look at various NFL uh, situations. A lot of – some coaches have that pull. Other ones, like the school that shall not be named at that point when they won, you know, were in the top eight four different times, a ton of of upper echelon power five programs and NFL programs wanted him to be the head coach. And so you're paying for that protection – and also for promise and potential. Uh, but for somebody, let's say Mel Tucker, that, that one really fascinates me. And, and Ari, maybe you can talk to more of this. One year at Michigan State, I mean, Mark D'Antonio had a really good run. It was stale at the end. But um, to pay him that, was the market there? And would it was it worth it to tether yourself to him for a long period of time when the potential is what right now that – It's very iffy whether they even get to the postseason this year. Yeah. Well, the thing that's interesting about the Mel Tucker scenario is, and like, I think that there are two types of discussions on the show. And Andy, you can, you know, definitely hop in here if you disagree with me. There is rational and calm off season discourse about programs, where they're headed and what the expectations are. And then there's during the season disaster conversations that make you forget everything that we were talking about. So when it comes to Michigan State, you remember it's been, what, five months since everybody piled on me for saying that they can't win a national championship and they're dumb for trying and all that stuff. Remember that? Not coming, Ari. Where is that energy now? Like, where where is everybody? Uh, being like, being fo- focused at being angry at Mel Tucker's contract. That's that's where that energy so, has so, been diverted. So they agree with me five months later? They yes, gave up they on the bill? With you again. You're not allowed to feel that way. They're allowed to feel that way. Okay, they, they're allowed to to change how there's a okay, that's what yes. I'm saying because like I <laughs> that's do, how this works. No, I know, but I'm saying, let what fan are you? Are you the 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 world is on fire? My team is losing games they shouldn't be losing during the regular season, and thus I took my eye off the ball. Or are you fan B who was calling me an asshole in the middle of the summer when I said this is a barely bad idea? Who is going to be patient enough to make sure that they remember that this is a long term thing? So like, that's the thing. Like if your mind changed on Mel Tucker's contract and you're a Michigan state fan, you did not understand what he's trying to do there. If you thought that it was going to be 10 win seasons every year for the first four years of his tenure, and then they were going to win a national championship in year six, you are either delusional or have no idea how the sport works. Yeah. So what, what he wants to do realistically it's a six-year thing, probably seven yes, years. Because mm-hmm. because they weren't recruiting at that level before. It's mm-hmm. it's not like, you know, like Jimbo Fisher and Kevin Sumlin. Kevin Sumlin was recruiting at a fairly high level. Jimbo Fisher comes in and takes it up a couple notches. That that's Mel Tucker has to take it up like 80 notches. It's a lot. <laughs> and it will take a long time if yeah. if if he actually is going to pull this off. I wrote and, a, I wrote a story. Um 
maybe two years ago now, like first when I got into this national position about like what it takes or how you can turn your program from good to great the, the way that, that Dabo did at Clemson. And I think the only rational way to do it is time. There's no overall fixes. Uh, there's no snap to the finger. There's no office max or office depot easy staples button easy staples button. staples easy button thank you whatever the andy staples easy Send button check right here um <laughs> so these types of seasons have to occur in the middle of the build for the build to be successful because if you pull the rug out from underneath them and this might be the angle of the story that i write then you're not understanding what the build was so if you want to give somebody a 10-year guaranteed contract like Mel Tucker to elevate Michigan State's uh, profile um, by chipping away at the block and hosting more visitors and increasing their recruiting class results year by year, you also have to be steadfastly supportive of the turmoil the program will inevitably have to go through as they swing and miss on guys and as they build slowly but surely. Um, and if you think that his contract is dumb, I think that's fine. I thought it was insane when they gave it to him. You also have to understand that he won't be around enough in an alternative universe where he doesn't sign that contract long enough to see this build through. So as dumb as it feels right now and how crazy Michigan State fans are going for a person like Mel Tucker in the moment, I think that it is within the realm of possibility since you Michigan State fans did flip me. Mm -hmm. that in 10 years we will look back at it and say, well, thank God they weren't able to fire him yet. Like that's the only hope. Okay. Well, let me, it, let me ask you a question. Cause we're, we've got these in various stages now because mm -hmm. you got Mel Tucker there. Obviously everybody's mad at Mario Cristobal right now. Cause they just lost, lost to Duke, but you can, you can say, well, it's year one. It, it, it's explained do, away. Do we know his contract scenario? It's a private school. We don't, the, but we can assume that he was. We know paid. it's ten years long. The assumption is it's mostly guaranteed. Uh, he would not have taken it if not. And he was. If he's looking around the country, seeing the contracts that are flying out of Michigan State and Penn State and all that, right? There's no way that he takes that job without something at least similar, right? Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Or, so, or leave Oregon. Yeah. 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 So, but let's let's look at the Jimbo Fisher situation. This is year five. Has he shown us what he is? Or, or is there potentially a Brian Kelly situation that could happen there where he could go? This could be his 2016, and, and then next year could be the beginning of, of the Renaissance. That's very interesting to me because they let – me, let me pose it to you this way. If Jimbo Fisher's buyout was currently between 10 and $15 million, would this be his last season at Texas A&M? Hmm. Well, would it be or should it be are different? No, would it be is the question, not should it I be. I think it would be. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. So this will give him the chance to fight his way out of it. How, how he decides to do that is up to him, whether it's, you know, you hire an OC, relinquish play calling, whether it's you hire a different OC than you have now. You have Daryl Dickey helping you now, but hire a different OC to help you with play calling, whether it's, you know, there, there are a bunch of ways to, to skin a cat. That is probably the biggest thing. That, that is the biggest issue right now is their offense doesn't work. He's supposed to be an offensive guru. Now, he's also a very good recruiter, organizer, motivator. He could still do all those things and have somebody else okay. bring in new ideas on offense. Will he is the question. He doesn't really have to. I know that we are recording this, but flip on your – your fake recording buttons, because I'm about to give you the clip uh, that probably will go on Twitter. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. <laughs> and this is the hottest take of hot takes. But maybe I, I think I, I, I believe it. I don't think I believe it. I believe it. If Texas A&M were put in a position where they could fire uh, Jimbo Fisher right now with impunity or to pay a small, reasonable buyout, I think think that they would probably do that right but i also think that the odds of them playing for an sec championship before the years of 2025 or 2026 would be worse in that scenario than they would if they stayed with their head coach right now interesting 
I think you're exactly right. Let me give you a. Uh, you're with me, Scott. Let me what give about you a counterpoint. With you? I'm counterpoint with you. Counterpoint, Ari. Yeah, Ron Zook. <laughs> well, Ron Zook stock covered pretty nice. That's a pretty good counterpoint. At Florida, and then Urban Meyer showed up. And did a lot more than Ron Zook ever did. I know. I'm just saying, like, sticking with the plan, hiring an offensive coordinator, and maybe, maybe changing the offense oh, enough I, to – I think yeah. the that path is work. much shorter than the they're, other path. Ari, their defense is good now. Yeah. Like, it's good now. And when wait till next year when there's going, defensive they're, they're linemen okay. get going. Yeah. So, is fixing your offense – and I don't know if – Scott, I'm sorry you got to be a part of this call, talk, but is fixing the offense is a far shorter road – than trying to fire your coach, pay whatever affordable buyout that you have, hire somebody else, and then give them two or three years for their version of their build. I think that this contract, again, and I think I'm talking myself into this, um, could be the saving grace for AM that wouldn't be able to get out of its way if it didn't have an $88 million uh, handcuffs on right now. Here, here's, a, here's a fun mm -hmm. one. Boy, I would love to, to be a fly on the wall in these meetings. <laughs> Raul Rodriguez. Can Jimbo bring in Dan Mullen as OC? Oh, he said a Dan Mullen. So someone like Dan Mullen. Oh. Jimbo and Dan Mullen together? Those two guys in the same room? Let's do it. I, yeah. I just want to see that for the for the drama right let's, there. Let's make it interesting. Hell yeah. Let's get I mean, him the out of the conversation. Could Nick that Saban could, bring that in could work? Nick like, Saban bring in Jimbo as an offensive analyst, save his career. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. obviously that's in the three next years. step. If if they give him the eighty six million dollar buyout, it, of course he'll be an offensive analyst. Now, I, coaches rehab, gentlemen. Well, we are going to pause right now. When we come back, though, I want to look at the jobs that are open this year, and we're going to imagine that. I don't know if it's a Miami style checkbook we've been given, but we're going to imagine that that the the athletic department and the the president's office have gotten together and we're going to get all the resources we want. We can hire anybody we want. How are we going to do it? Given all that we've just discussed, we'll talk about it. when We come back. If you've been watching the show on the YouTube stream at any point in the last year, you've seen me wearing these polos with three little X's along the shoulder blades. Those are from Roan and they're probably the best fitting polos I've ever worn. Roan was not an advertiser until just this week, but I've been buying their stuff for a while the Delta Piquet polo, one of my favorites. The commuter pant, the commuter jogger, they make you look professional, but you feel like you're wearing athleisure. And, and that commuter pant, you know, it looks great. That commuter jogger, you want to look professional, but say, I also have sexy ankles. It's tremendous. Now, Roan is revolutionizing the dress shirt because it's hard to find really good fitting dress shirts, but they've added the commuter dress shirt. It hugs you in all the right places. You don't look like you've got a big paunch and it feels like the most comfortable shirt you own. It feels just as good as any of your t-shirts or your polos. And they also have gold fusion anti-odor technology. You'll be smelling fresh and clean all day. And on top of that, Ronin's is hundred percent machine washable. You can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. This is great because it's stuff you can wear to work. It's also stuff you can wear in your leisure time. Believe it or not, sometimes I have to wear pants on the job and it's usually a pair of Roan pants. And I will tell you the machine washable thing, absolutely true. Having owned a bunch of their stuff, it holds up very, very well after the washing and the drying. So head to Roan.com, that's R-H-O-N-E.com slash Andy and use the promo code Andy to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you go to Roan.com, R-H-O-N-E.com slash Andy and use the code Andy. It's time to find your corner office comfort. We're all back in our routines now. It's football season. School's in session. Kids are doing a variety of activities. There's a lot going on. You know what you don't need to be doing? Going to the grocery store, chopping up stuff, cooking stuff. That takes a lot of time that, that a lot of days you don't have. What you need is freshly. Freshly fits your lifestyle with plans tailored to every dietary preference. These are meals that are fresh, not frozen, delivered to your door, and you can heat them and enjoy them in just three minutes. No cooking, no dishes, and no trips to the store. They have a huge selection. We've got a celiac person in our house, so we, we need gluten-free stuff. They have an amazing 
menu of gluten-free food. And every week they're adding new recipes, new dishes, and it's tremendous. And you don't have to chop a single thing. So skip the grocery store and the dirty dishes without relying on frozen dinners or takeout. Meals arrive cooked fresh every week, and there's always something new to try. And now you can try freshly and lock in huge savings across your first five orders. Take advantage of Freshly sale right now and score a special deal. $125 off your first five orders at Freshly.com slash Andy22. That's Freshly.com slash Andy22. Freshly.com slash Andy22 for $125 off your first five orders. Welcome back. So we've talked about these 10-year contracts, and now I, I'm going to put us in the shoes of Let's see, the, the athletic director that Auburn is probably about to hire, the AD, well, we, we don't know if it's going to be Ray Anderson at Arizona State or somebody else. Uh, will Trev Alberts at Nebraska, who conceivably could have a ton of money to spend? What do you do if you're in this situation? Because we know now that hiring someone with a very proven track record, or in Mel Tucker's case, not a huge proven track record, but interest from another big job, that's going to require you to spend an obscene amount of money and guarantee an obscene amount of money. Are you willing to do that? Or do you say two of the three best coaches in America right now were assistants when they were hired as head coaches and say, I'm going to hire somebody who I don't have to guarantee all this money to. I, I, Scott, you go ahead. But I, oh, I, I mean, you're paying for the leader of your program. You're playing for, paying for the leader of your state. I think it's about profile and how you go about it. And you've got to believe in that person because you've got to you've got to hire that person in mind, thinking that if this person fails, so do you, and you will be fired for it. And uh, and I think the right kind of contract along those lines with even somebody as high profile as some of the people we've discussed is somewhere in the six to seven year range. And then an automatic renegotiation after three, which uh, you get an extension to ensure that there's a five-year window. But okay, I'll play Jimmy Sexton. No, my guy's not leaving for that. All right, we'll go to the next guy. There you go. But you're not in, like ADs ever say that they won't no. do that. Yeah. Well, desperation is a very, very powerful drug. I think, um, Here's the thing that I struggle with the most, and it kind of goes back to those stats, but but even so, there are, have been certain coaching hires in the past six, seven years that have been considered, no doubt about it. And mm -hmm. Scott Frost obviously comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. There wasn't a single person in the media uh, or anywhere else that said this is going to be a problem for them. It was like... Everybody stood up and clapped their but, hands. But we did say it'd be a problem when they randomly extended him for no reason. Yeah, but not notwithstanding, like him going yeah, still. to no, no, but still, like in the moment when he got hired, the day he got hired, there was it was it was a can't miss, no doubt about it. Obviously, this is going to work type hire. The same thing with Michigan mm -hmm. and Jim Harbaugh, and I guess you can make the case that as he's trending that, toward pass. That one has worked. It, it has worked now that we're here, but he might not have gotten to the spot in other scenarios. And if, especially if he wasn't willing to take a half of a salary for a year. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you go back and you look at the can't, can't miss no doubt about it hires, and maybe there's other examples that I'm missing that they haven't panned out at a nearly high enough conversion rate to guarantee anything. Mm -hmm. So desperation makes you want to believe that 10 years is not that long of a time and that that person he, he, here's will my change argument. it, but there's here's no testimony for it. For going with the assistant or the group of five head coach, because you're going to get fired if this doesn't work anyway. So if you hire the, the 10 year contract coach, there's more than a 50, 50 shot. You're getting fired over that contract. And they're going to pay you to not work. So, and you get hired by somebody else but because also, college athletics, and you were you were the AD at a big school. If Kirby Smart were a coaching candidate now, could he demand a similar type deal? So Brent Venables got a similar type deal. He got six mm. years fully guaranteed. So it's, that's, it feel like this is the trend right now. But that's half of what. 
Yeah, six years is, is a lot more easy to come across or come around on than 10, I think. Right. Well, and, and it's not, it's, yeah. it's, it's $43 million. So mm-hmm. that's half of what Jimbo's guaranteed right now. So yeah. that's different. Three years from now, that buyout feels pretty manageable. But I would absolutely do it if there was a better track record and testimony of success with these no doubt about it guys. And I assume that if you give like the thing that is most fascinating to me about it is the Penn State one. Well, here because at Michigan State, they were buying into a re branding and a new way of going about football at their university. They bought into a promise that they will recruit at a higher level and thus compete at a higher level at Texas A&M. They got a coach that had a national championship ring um, and was supposed to be one of the few pl- coaches that will become available that have done that in the Penn state gave that contract to a person who did a very good job or a pretty good job at Penn state, but hadn't, saved the program and like that one is the weirdest one to me because they already had more than enough to know what james franklin was and is when that contract came through so i mean it is interesting as we're talking about these 10-year deals how there's a lot of different people in different positions right andy like you mentioned jimbo fisher's towards the awkward stage right yeah uh but you have james franklin who uh was he in year eight when they gave him that deal is it year eight? He got there 14. So, yeah, it was like seven, 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 seven or eight, whatever. Yeah. So Similar. he was already through the the seven years of his deal. You've got Mario Cristobal, who is the no doubt about it hire of Miami, mm-hmm. getting a deal or something similar to that. And you've got a bunch of first-year guys at important places. And Brian Kelly, too, is a, is a proven coach with no national championship ring that probably has something similar to that as well. But they're all kind of in different phases of it. Um, but I'm not necessarily sure that I would pay that much money for anybody not named Smart or Saban. Well, Stephen Larkin asked an interesting question because it is sort of the crux of, of what we were talking about here. Who made a better hire last offseason, Florida or LSU? Florida hires Billy Napier from Louisiana Lafayette. LSU hires Brian Kelly from Notre Dame. Uh, we don't know who made the better hire yet. We will probably need a couple of years to find out. But which one would you want to be handcuffed to? That's a good question. I, I think Kelly feels like the more sure bet, but you had to, you had to get double the guarantee. So Billy Napier is not going to get fired after this year, but his buyout, if he were to get fired after this year would be $38 million. So obviously that, they're not paying that, but that's what's guaranteed to him right now. Brian Kelly is guaranteed 90% of $85 million, which I'm, I'm doing the math there. That's like $77 million, right? If he wins a national title at LSU, his contract becomes fully guaranteed, which you laugh, but the last two guys won a national title and got fired at LSU. So uh, that is – that's one – I we'll have to see who winds up being right there because, you know, with Florida, yes, LSU just beat Florida, but you did hire Billy Napier because you were not satisfied with Dan Mullen's recruiting, so you need to give him some time to work on the roster. If in three years you're in the same place and LSU has – won the SEC West a couple times or won the SEC or, or competed for national title. Well, Scott Woodward could do the victory lap. But if they're in the same place, then Scott Strickland did better. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's all about your program too. There are some programs that you are in the upper echelon and you need to maintain it. And that includes having the highest profile coach and paying the highest profile coach. But none of the coaches that are there, none of those programs that are in that position have done that. Well, Alabama, you know, I mean, you know, even going back to Nick when he was hired, um, you know, did, but what I'm saying is uh, if you're Oklahoma, I don't know why you do that with a, a career assistant who's never proven it. Right. Uh, his, his other option was go back to Clemson and make $2 million a year, a little over $2 million a year, which is a great option, which I had that option. But yeah. I don't, if you make that buyout 50% instead of 100%, I don't think he says no to that job. Right. I mean, Oklahoma is an upper echelon blue blood program that you can win national championships it, with. If you it it goes right. back to, I was screaming when Ed Orgeron got hired at LSU after being the interim. And, and they said, well, the buyout, if he gets fired, is this. And I'm like, why does he have a buyout? Yeah. 
the buyout if he gets fired should be zero in that situation. Would you guys give Ryan Day a hundred million guaranteed for ten years? No, because I think I could hire a lot of people to do that, to do what he's doing there. Not a, maybe not a lot, but there are multiple people who could do what he's doing there because everybody who gets that job basically does that. Because it does seem kind of lopsided that the people who have it have done less than the people who deserve it the most. Because I would never give Ryan Day that contract. So we've got we got Jack Bauer from – Zach Bauer, FBI or CIA? I can't remember. The dude not saying – that will shall not be named is the dumbest, most annoying thing I've ever seen. You don't get the show. We forced <laughs> Scott to talk about that team every blessed week since the season started. And we promised uh, for once we wouldn't make him do it. Jack needs to go back to 24, man. I, I kind of missed that exactly. show. Plus we have Which, people complaining uh, that we talk about them too much. Also yeah, would right. be a nice 24 would be a nice average points per game for that team. If only, if only, God. I had a fan of that team say to me, at least Texas A&N's offense can score. And I'm like, I think watching that team has warped your idea of what the phrase at least can score means. Yeah, I, I didn't think that Texas A&M was that further ahead. I watched both of those games in entirety. It's, and it's basically... Iowa, it's oh! Oh, uh, we've all done it now. We yeah, all we're all there. fired. We all jumped in the the pot, uh, but... the team that we're not supposed to say looked more like a clown car, and A uh, and M looked more in, uh, inept. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, you know, two years ago they averaged 31.8 points per game. Now they're averaging. Yeah, they've scored seven offensive touchdowns in seven. As you say, we God. have to back out the defensive scores before we before we've we got, feel like the we've average. got 56 minutes into this thing. I've got to ask, when Pete just threw that pick on the second play of the game. <laughs> Stop, Ari! First, just, first play. First play of the game, sorry. Uh, what happened in the press box, and what did you do? Uh, you know, kind of roll my eyes and laugh. I was probably more so that way in the second half when they finally switched quarterbacks, and there was a fumbled snap. And then on the next possession, there were, on the second play, there was another interception. I'm like, I just tweeted – I need to keep my notes for this oral history in five years. So did yeah. they, now, did they have two weeks to prepare a new center for a game at a place known to be loud that the head coach and the offensive line coach had both coached in before, so uh, they knew it would be loud if the game was close, uh, and then decided to go with a verbal cadence anyway? Did they do that? I, You know what? There are so many questions about this game. That, they didn't that, do that. Yeah, that, no. was, that was Texas a and Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well we made it almost an hour yeah. i tried we were, guys i thought i was going to be able to make it and i didn't yeah. and then we, we had to get into some hot hawkeye talk but this was a very interesting discussion guys uh for all the people who don't like it when we play grab ass and and eat taco bell there you go mm -hmm. you had a nice meaty show of a bunch of hardcore football talk <laughs> so on wednesday we're gonna <laughs> eat like 10 pounds of taco bell <laughs> Man. Talk to you later. All right.